All right, we're here with a brand new All Access with composer Sharon Farber. Sharon, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to sit down today. It's such a pleasure to, ch to chat. It's my pleasure and thank you for having me. So uh, to start off, I'd love to know kind of, a, kind of your origin story. Like looking back at your childhood, what, what do you remember as kind of the first uh, things where music kind of entered your life and it became more than just a, a hobby or an interest? It kind of became kind of part of who you were. Um, yeah, I come from a very musical family. My grandfather played guitar and my grandmother played mandolin and they would do these little concerts for us, you know, for the family when we came there and my, uh, my grandfather was a dancer and he wrote music and he spoke several, I mean, really amazing people. And my mom was a ballerina and my, my dad played piano. And my uncle is one of Israel's well-known and best celebrities uh, as a songwriter. Um, so it was kind of in the family. And I started the piano when I was seven, along oh, with wow. my sister, Renat, who was nine at the time. And after about two years, she decided she didn't want to do it. And my mom said, you know, you're already, you're nine years old, you know, you can make your own decision. So would you like to continue? And I said, yes. And I continued and I uh, did my high school in uh, high school for the arts. And then, you know, I was working as a piano teacher and I was doing some music for theater and, and you know, the whole thing. And I felt at one point that I needed to spread my wings. And mm -hmm. Berkeley um, College of Music did a scholarship to around Europe. And they came to, to Israel and I auditioned and I got a scholarship. And that yeah. was after, you know, and a lot of people say that they, you know, since they were five, they knew that they wanted to be a film composer. I, I didn't know that. Um, you know, it's and it, it's a little, um, if you're a young person today, you have more access to everything. Yeah. Um, and it was a little different then, but I knew my life would be in music. I just didn't know exactly what. Uh, and someone hooked me on, on film music. So I went to Berkeley with the uh, thought of, okay, I'm going to do a one-year diploma and, and that's it in film school. And of course, you know, the rest is history, but <laughs> okay. I came there and I loved it so much, so much that I um, very, very fast, I switched to a degree and then later, a little later on to dual degree in film, uh, film scoring and concept composition. And I do both till today. So um, it, it was just like... It, I knew that I'm not going to be a classical pianist because to sit down eight hours a day and practice someone else's music, even yeah. if it's Chopin or Bach or Mozart, I loved it, but I just felt like I wanted to express myself more. And yeah. when I graduated from Berkeley, I won the internship with the um, TV Academy. And I spent two months with Jonathan Wolf, who was doing Seinfeld at the time, and Alf Klassen, who was doing The Simpsons. And then Jonathan uh, introduced me to the one and only Shirley Walker and oh, yes. Shirley she she was just really the best and Shirley took me under musical wings and you know I was orchestrating and then later on writing music for Batman Superman the WB animated series of course like, classic. I was two months yeah and I was like yeah. two months in the stars like it was a dream come true you know because we would record with with an orchestra every week uh so sometimes Sony one uh, Warner Brothers you know I mean uh, Paramount, wherever there was uh, the stage was set, and and it was just so amazing that um, you know it's magic, right? Yeah, it's magic. it's it's just it's something it's about magic. being it's part magic. of it and being part of storytelling. Yeah, yeah. that's why I think and we you know, all get into um, it. And I also did the Ask a Film Scoring Workshop, and right. you know I got to write and conduct my own music with the best musicians you know in the world. And once I conducted a full orchestra, I knew I could never go back. <laughs> That's I know, it. you're, you're, you're wielding the life. power there. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and then after about a year, uh, Warner Brothers decided no more, um, no more full, no more live orchestra. They had enough for for the rest of their life and the life of the yeah. show. So that's when I went on on my own individually and uh, and here we are <laughs> i know here we are and you've had such an amazing <laughs> uh, versatile career um 
Uh, and I do, before we jump into more of your process and approach, I did want to say congratulations on your score for Brainwashed uh, Sex Camera Power, which uh, is an incredibly important documentary um, focusing on the portrayal of women in cinema and how, you know, a male dominated medium has kind of portrayed women on screen and kind of changed what the public consciousness is. Um, the film is making a de uh, its debut at Sundance this year, which is amazing. Yes. And uh, on Monday, January 24th, uh, you're going to actually going to sit down with um, Nina Mink as your director mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, ASCAP Screen Time Conversation, which is part of ASCAP's annual um, Sundance Music Cafe. And I just want to let people know that they can check it out uh, by creating a free account and going to festival.sundance.org. And, uh, and I think that's going to be an amazing conversation. I always love to see composers yeah. and their directors discussing. So, yes, um, but I do... Yeah, especially this film, which is incredibly important. I'm so glad it's finally getting out there and, and out in the world. Um, yes. And by before... the way, um, the U.S. premiere is at Sundance, but the international premiere is at Berlin. Oh, wow, in Berlin. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's already at Berlin at the Berliner Film Festival. We're very excited. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I do, we, we will talk about it. I do want to ask mm -hmm. you about it. But um, before we jump into um, uh, Brainwash, I'd love to just kind of talk about your your general process and your approach, uh, specifically for film and television. I always like to ask composers where the first note comes from. You know, where do you love to kind of sit and see the first cut? If you're at that point in, the, in this, you know, coming onto the project, do you like to talk to the director? Uh, do you like to go for a walk? What is generally your process when you need to start getting that first idea and pulling it out of your head? Um, usually, uh, when I, when I start working with the director, first I'd like to see the film. Mm. Sometimes I get to read a script. If you're lucky and after that, early. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that's when you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when there's enough time, uh, usually we get it and we have to start right away, right? Because mm. it's always like we needed it yesterday. Um, right. But um, I'd like to watch a film two or three times, you know, mm. um, sometimes with temp and sometimes without temp. Right. So I get the essence of it. Um, and then I, I'd like to have, before we do spotty notes and everything, I'd like to talk to the director uh, and, and hear about what made them make this film. What is right. their vision for the film? Why did they make this film? What did they want to say in this film? What's important to them in this film? What is the, the uh, overall vision, uh, even if they don't know anything about music? Right. What do you yeah. want to say? To, to the audience who's going to come and watch this. Um, and that gives me, you know, the first impression of, and of course, if you have temp music, then, then you kind of being guided already. Um, right. But like, for example, the film I'm working on, on a, on a film right now, and the director said, I don't like the temp. <laughs> so it's just there for a little bit of guidance in regard of, the vibe, the general vibe, but don't follow it. And sometimes, um, like in Brainwash, it was actually the temp was extremely important, and we'll talk about that a little later. So, and and then uh, the way I, I work usually is after we talked and we did a spot in a session, I find that the first 20 minutes of, of scored film are the most important ones mm -hmm. because that sets the tone. And if the director is happy with the first 20 minutes, everything after that is so much easier and, and goes way smoothly. Um, so usually I would do the first scene and send it to the director to see is this is really what you're thinking of? Is it, uh, am I in the right direction? And, um, and then every time I do a scene, of course, I send it to the director because I want to be, of course, approved on, on everything. Yeah. But where does it come from? It can come not only from, I mean, there's so many elements. So of course we have the visual. So how is it shot? What are the colors right. of the film? Uh, what is the general vibe of the atmosphere of the film? Is it inside, is it outside, is it external? Yeah. Is what, what is the dialogue? How do they shoot the, the actors? You know, every little thing gives you a guide of what you need to say musically in order to support a vision of the director. Um, and of course, there's the deadline. Yeah, that <laughs> deadline always is pushes. A, is a, <laughs> the best inspiration. 
And usually, you know, with, with films, as, as I'm sure many, many composers have already um, told you that, you know, it depends how you approach it. Sometimes you approach it by, by setting uh, a melody, a harmony, a sound mm -hmm. to certain characters. And then the, uh, the music follows and the, every time you see the character, the music will, of the character will, will, will be played in definitely other variations, but it's there. Or, you know, sometimes there are like two, three, four um, melodies or again, uh, motifs um, that repeat throughout the film in different ways. So if you have a big external scene of, I don't know, war, for example, then you play it with a full orchestra and everything is big, and unless you want to go against the picture, which is also something that we can do, like yeah. James Horner did in Glory. Um, but then you'll, try, you'll take this motif and now maybe we have an, exter an, an internal uh, delicate or more intimate uh, scene, so you can use, of course, and you should use this this this, this motif that you composed, but in a different way. Maybe now it's only oboe and harp. Maybe it's only piano. Depends mm -hmm. on on what's needed. So uh, that's a little bit uh, elaboration uh, of your original question. But there's just so much that, to guide you. There's also the yeah. flow of the film. So yeah, the yeah, edit, the pacing, yeah. The pacing, right? The, because it's like a story. You're telling a story. So mm -hmm. there's a beginning, a middle, an end, and everything needs to flow. Music is like, it's, it's like the glue that puts everything together. It needs to be an integral part of the film. If, if you feel it coming, you feel it going, there's something is not working. It needs to be so flawless that it works on our subconscious mind, right? It, because, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, music has just got it. You, it takes it away from the experience of watching a film because all of a sudden your attention is somewhere else. So exactly. it needs to be holding everything together, supporting. Um, and, and, you know, some, some director want, want you to help the audience feel. And some directors, or exactly the opposite they're like yeah don't do, i don't want the music to influence yeah don't hold their hands <laughs> right the viewer let yeah. them make their own decision so it's really about um it's a matter of of taste and you know uh it's interesting because one of the reasons that i work in both mediums um you know the, the film tv world and the concert world is because yeah. it's when you work at, on a film or a TV show, then you your job is to bring the director's vision to life. Right, it's not your vision, it's the it's director's vision. It's not your vision. vision. Yeah. I mean, I want to be proud. But it is your of vision, yeah, of course. Exactly, yeah, yeah no, no, I got, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I want to be proud of every note I write, but mm -hmm. I am always keeping in mind the fact that someone else has worked on this film for so long. One of the films that I've done uh, when Nietzsche wept was, it was a six years in the making, six years in the making. Wow. Yeah. So it's like being pregnant for six years and all of a sudden <laughs> the, the, the baby is out and someone else needs to dress it and feed it. It's very scary. Yeah, you're taking well, somebody else, yeah. And you're usually, exactly. the, typically you're so, the last person to come in and touch it. And it's like, and you know, that director is probably in a mess, you know, like so stressed and everything and, now it's yeah. on your shoulders. <laughs> it's on our shoulders. So we need to be the problem solver, not the problem maker for, mm -hmm. for a, a filmmaker. So ego is aside. And I also find that usually, not always, but usually when a director has a comment on my music, they usually make my music better. Mm. Sometimes, I don't feel like that. And I think that sometimes, yeah. you know, you have to speak out when you feel the direction is not right, but you right. have to pick up your battles because I come from a very deep respect for filmmakers. I mean, mm -hmm. our job is already stressful, right? To, to right. make someone else happy and make this whole thing happen. But I mean, just the thought of making a film from nothing, you know, financing, script, financing, finance. I mean, it's so much work that, I want to honor their process 
you know, and make sure that I'm, I'm doing whatever I can in order to make it happen for them. So while in concert music, it's different because in concert music, I can be totally free. I mean, they, yes, they can tell me, that. you know, you have, uh, we ask for uh, a choral, you know, I don't know, a cappella piece that is 10 minutes on the subject of children. Right. You know. Then, the, but this is my only limitations, right? Everything else is what I feel, what I want to bring to the table. So I feel that by making this dis distinction between my work as a film composer and my work as a concert composer, I, it's like uh, it's all comes it all comes together. You know, I can yeah. be free to a point here, but really free here. So I I never feel frustrated frustrated because a filmmaker decided not to use this cue or this cue or something like that because I know that. I have other work that people come to hear without mm. watching anything. So um, I, I think it, it's just a really great balance. Right now, I'm working on this film and I, I'm almost done. And then I have a commission from Juilliard School of Music. Wow, I'm that's very amazing. excited about it. So <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's there's always something, you know, there's always something to do. Absolutely. And I, and I can imagine, um, so to, speaking on your concert music, which, I mean, you've had it performed around the world and um, when you're creating, so we talked about, you know, shaping and where the first note comes from for a film, maybe on the other end of that, where does it come from? Uh, how does a, when you're, you're doing a concert work, how, do, where does the idea come from? Because you're, you're still telling a story musically, but it's, it's, you know, you're, you don't have visuals. Uh, I mean, I think music, uh, ignites visuals in me when I listen to, especially concert music or classical music where, and I think it's a, a beautiful loop because as a screenwriter, I love to listen to scores to other music to ignite ideas and, and moods and stuff. But so for you as a storyteller, when you're writing a piece of music like that, where does the idea for the for the concert come from? What kind of do you have to come up with a story idea first? Do you come up with a melody that kind of, oh, I can make that into what I'm trying to say? You know, what topic do you decide to choose, you know, for whatever your concert's going to be? Um, it's it's a good question. And, and by the way, it's when I write concert music, I use the, the piano and, and a mm. pen or a pencil yeah. um, way more than when I write film music, which is already, you know, everything goes into the computer. Right. But um, it, in concert music, it depends uh, because usually when you get commissioned, they do give you some kind of guidance, for example. Sure. Yeah. And, and of course, if you have lyrics, then you know it's it's a different um, different story because the lyrics would guide you the, the feel of the lyrics you know it will guide you to um, to what you want to say and you know it's um, uh, a few years ago there was a, a Jewish um, reporter from the um, um, Wall Street Journal named Daniel Pearl. Daniel Perel was murdered in Pakistan just because yes. he was Jewish. I don't know if you, you remember. Yeah, it was a national story. story. Yeah, they yeah. beheaded him on. It was horrible. And his father is a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And when um, he called me, and at the time I was writing arrangement for for the choir that he was conducting, and he called me and said, "Please take the choir and." and because Daniel has been kidnapped and we don't know what's, I mean, what do you do when, when yeah. what do you do? I mean, I, I can't say he's, he'll be back because I don't know if he's going to be back. I, so I wrote a piece of music. I took a poem that I loved as a child and I um, composed it for a cappella choir. And it's about three mothers who cry for their sons who died in or disappeared in the war and mm -hmm. it's very very moving and I just you know it was many years ago it, I was still starting out there wasn't a lot of money and I remember th I thought how because I called a group of friends to to record it but I needed a studio and I remember th thinking how am I going to pay for this and I said I don't care this is my gift to the dear pearl and I recorded on Sunday, and on Saturday, I got my first check from ASCAP wow. for exactly the same amount that I needed for the studio. 
Wow. And I was like, maybe there is someone over there that is watching over us. And and then uh, Grant Gershon took it to the LA Master Call and it was, you know, um, premiered by the LA Master, Master Call. And there were like 3,000 people in the audience. And when they, and this is a cappella piece. And when the, the piece ended, there was this complete silence for like 30 seconds. Nobody said a word and his father was in the audience. And nobody said a word. And then people started clapping. And it, and it was, that's when I understood even more the power of music, what yes. it really did. Yeah. Because this was in Hebrew. People did not, I mean, there was a translation, but they didn't understand sure. every word it was sung. Yeah. And, and it's just, we have such power to influence. Um, so, when I write concert music, it could come from this, you know, from the written word. And if there's not a written word, then I would still get, you know, some kind of guidance. Like there's one piece that I was guided to write um, uh, six variation on on a melody, original melody. Mm -hmm. But I always make myself um, some kind of of image and when I give the word, the, the piece uh, a name that also influences influences me. So many, many years ago, I, I got commissioned to write a piece by an organization called, uh, I don't know if they exist, uh, the Sacred Music Foundation. And they wanted something that, that will be about, you know, uh, peace between people. So I decided to write something that will be really the main, the three main religions. And I call it Ashkina. Ashkina is love in Turkish. And it's called, mm -hmm. it's very um, close to the Hebrew word Shkina, Ashkina, which is the spirit of God. And I wrote it for a choir and small orchestra and three main ethnic instrumentalists. So one was Omar Farouk Tebilek, who's a Turkish musician, wonderful. And he played oud, and he played uh, um, dumbak, and he played uh, duduk, and there was a flamenco guitarist, and another percussionist who happens to be my husband. And it's it's like a 25 minutes piece that goes from from like like starts with a kind of a Christianity feel to it, and then goes to Judaism, and then goes to Islam, and this whole thing, and you know. I did write um, some lyrics to it, and there was another person who wrote some lyrics, but most of it was not, there was, there was a lot of um, empty space with no lyrics. Yeah. But the whole idea really inspired me, you know, to, to, um, to make this connection between these three, you know, religions. Yeah. And, once I had the first motif, that motif went over everything. Doesn't matter if I was now working on the more Christianity part or the Jewish, or it just went through everything, and it made this this thread that we need in music, maybe concert music or maybe film music or TV music. You need this thread to hold everything together, so there's a connection. And for me, you know. There's every every composer writes differently, and there are many concert composers who write um, very modern music. So I'll say, you know, that is goes through you, to, to your brain, um, and you have to analyze it and understand it, and it's fascinating. Yeah. For me, and this is one of the reasons that I write film music is because I want to get into the heart of people. Yes, the and emotions. Yeah. Right, and with film music, you can do it more because you can write melody and harmony, and you won't be considered, oh my god, this is like old music or romantic music or whatever. You can still, you know, have the beauty and the uh, purpose of writing music that goes straight to the heart, and it's the same with concert music. Because when I, when someone comes to the concert hall before the corona and hopefully after. <laughs> Um, you know, they want to leave their reality outside. Maybe you had a really bad 
day at the office and, and you just live outside, everything outside, and you come to hear music to, to affect you. So I want people, when they hear my music, to be affected, you yeah. know, in, in a way. You know, uh, I want them to leave the concert hall a little different than they came in. Absolutely. Um, right, and, and I think it's yeah. the power of music. So everything that I do, and I, I really take pride in every note. I want all, every note. I want to stand behind every note that I write. But everything inspires me when I start a piece. You know, it doesn't matter what I work on. So I hope that answered the question somehow. Yeah, absolutely, it was so beautifully put. Thank you. Oh, I mean, that's <laughs> and I agree completely because you know you're you're mentioning oh yeah there was some stuff stuff in Hebrew people don't understand but you know music is such a universal language and you're connecting. In I, I love that music can identify a culture and a nationality but also it brings everyone together at the same time and meshing different sounds and styles and instruments and uh, it's, that's why I fell in love with. It. I'm actually not a musician myself. I'm not a composer, but it's what got me into filmmaking and storytelling and whether you're sitting at a campfire strumming on a guitar or a couple hundred people lo looking at a screen in a theater or a thousand people in a concert hall you know if i feel it it just brings people together yeah and, and i've learned something very important uh, when i did this piece uh, called the third mother uh, mother's lament because i went to the rehearsal with Ger grand gershon the 120 singers mm. the best singers in town <laughs> singing a piece in hebrew um and I recorded it with a group of friends before that, and I sent it to Judea Pro as my gift. And I came with a friend of mine who was a wonderful musician. And when they started singing the piece, it was very slow, way slower than I recorded it. And I was about to say, no, no, this is the wrong tempo. And she stopped me and she said, Sharon, Grant does not understand every lyrics, but he understand the, the physical, the, the phrase, you, you understand mm -hmm. the musical phrase that you put together. Let him feel it. And she was so right in it. I, I've learned such a great lesson because the way he performed it was so much better than, than what I did actually, because he took the time to explore every, every note. The, some of the harmonies are, are complicated and it was just magic magic so you know that's another thing that i have learned to give respect to to every musician that i work with because sometimes they can bring to to the table something that i didn't think of yeah. so they add their know, own stamp to it yeah they add their own yeah. voice to it literally or figuratively yeah yeah <laughs> we have to to always stay open and and you know, not be stuck in, oh, this is, this is the way I wrote it. No, let's, let's see, you yeah. know, what can be um, added and what can be, you know, um, I did a film that's called The Dove Flyer. The film takes place in Iraq. Now, I'm not from Iraq. I'm from Israel, but Israel is a, is a fusion of many, many cultures and yes, like from, yeah. From my my parents' house in in Israel, I can hear the uh, Muslim muezzin singing every night. So mm -hmm. these are things that am, are embedded in you. And when I had to um, to score this film, um, I brought in someone who plays an instrument called kamanche or kamenche, which is a Middle Eastern violin. It's 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 so beautiful. And although I wrote the main motifs, I knew that I'm not a Comanche player. And right. these people can improvise the best. <laughs> and, you know, we work together and his improvisation brought the film to another level. It was, it was beautiful. So we have, I think sometimes as composers, unless it's something that, you know, you have a click track, the whole orchestra plays together. Right, but yeah. But sometimes there's room to give the you know the player a chance to express themselves. Um, so I, I try to always be respectful of that too, because you know the people we work with are usually just wonderful musicians. And if I don't play the instrument, which I don't many times, it's I just want to learn from them how how to write better for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so well well put. That's amazing. Um, I would love to now move 
uh, back to brainwashed. Uh, I think we've talked about kind of the general uh, idea of music and what it means and everything now focusing down on a, on a single project of yours. Um, talk about what was your approach for, for this documentary and you know you have a lot of clips I mean you're breaking down film techniques you also have a lot of talking heads I think documentaries also present a different challenge than normal film so I'm curious how did you approach this and of course working with Nina and and all that process yeah so brainwash is brainwashed music is very far from a typical brain a typical documentary yeah first I had full orchestra wow yeah that's rare <laughs> that's rare on uh, especially on the documentary and, and the reason I had the full orchestra was because when I watched the film the first time this is a very disturbing film we'll, we'll talk yeah. about it in a minute but when I watched the film the whole film is tempted with the brilliancy of Bernard Herrmann vertigo oh wow <laughs> which is a genius score. <laughs> yeah. And here I am. This is the time. Just, you know, do something kind of similar. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what a challenge. Yeah. And um, so I said to Nina, I said, Nina, this film calls for an orchestra. We cannot do you know, this kind of vibe and, and music with, you know, just computer music. And, and I have the best sounds and the best samples and everything, and I can right. mimic up, you know, and do a great mock-up. Mm -hmm. It's not the same, and I hope it will never no. be the same. Yeah, I don't think it'll ever be the same. <laughs> I hope so, because there's something about, you know, 50 violins playing together and each puts you know the finger on on the string a bit different but that's what mm. makes it so alive and she agreed so i'm 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 so thankful to nina for for she said absolutely you're right i want a full orchestra and nina has never worked with a composer before never wow. in her film so, she always makes her sounds and stuff so she never worked with a composer before so when she told me that, I knew, I knew that I needed to be even more respectful and more um, understanding that. And she said, I don't know anything about music. And I work, usually just make my own sounds. And I, I never worked with a composer. So yeah. you have to help me and guide me. Um, and so I watched the film. I was... It was very disturbing, especially yeah. some of the film, some of the scenes there, because I realized the film really explores how women are being shot in the film and how the male gaze, the camera angle, you know, the lighting on a woman's face or body, mm -hmm. how it truly affects us in a subconscious way because as a woman if you know when I watch a film I never think about these things yeah. and all of a sudden it's like putting a mirror to Hollywood and 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 saying hey there's there's a problem that we that we haven't addressed we need to talk about it because this kind of stuff leads to rape yes. leads to you know inequality in pay yes yeah and making women do things on camera but also behind camera and i can speak from my own personal experience that they don't want to do you yeah. know and uh you either do that or your career is over i mean it's just there are a few scenes there that as as a woman and as a mom I have a 10 years old at home yeah. and I was like oh my god even Michael Stern you know uh, my engineer and I was like I, as a father it's it's and he did an amazing job by, by the way um this is really really hard to watch and the way Nina constructed it is so smart because we move from you know things that are okay that's not okay that's not two things that are like oh my god yeah that's so wrong and if you if a 15 16 17 years old boy 
see this and think that's okay because they're showing it in films, yeah. then how would he treat his girlfriend? So, but back to the, so, so on, a, on a personal level, it really affected me. And I can assure anyone who's watching it that you will never watch a film the same way again. That's how um, significant and disturbing this film is. Um, yeah. It's not a horror film, but it, it shows you um, how we as a society are, are really contributing to that. Absolutely. And it, it's, anyway, so. <laughs> I mean, it's the problem that, the, you know, you have a male dominated field for this, you know, whatever, 100 years plus, And it's like male producers, directors, and there's not there's so much inequality behind the camera. And it's it's going to be one sided. And it's and that's what and you, I think that's what's important for this film showing that, that it's just it's it's infu infusing that narrative into culture, into human behavior. And, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Especially today, everything is so easy to approach you know you have yeah. internet you can you can see this all the time all the time all the time and, and you know when young girls see pop stars that are half naked on stage you know wiggling their butt <laughs> yeah and they think that this is this is what's right but right. if they don't yeah. do that they're not cool enough they're not sexy enough they're not desirable enough and yeah there's so much so many problems with this generation you know and, and when you know 10 years old are, are you know starving themselves to be thin you know or or want uh, i don't know their lips to be inflated yeah i mean it's yeah. just like as a mom I'm, I'm i'm you know really protecting my daughter but how long will i be able to do that so it's all about education and and talking and explaining and it's it's interesting um, and it's complicated and it's Very, challenging. Yeah. It's challenging yeah. and we have to be aware. So in regard to so so this film as uh, on a music level um, presented a lot of challenges. Of course, first, how do I make this the vibe of vertigo without being vertigo? Right. Yeah. Second, all these film clips, what do I do with all these film clips? So, you know, I came into my own exploration of the sound that I wanted and the motif that I wanted. Um, lots of augmented chords, for example, mm -hmm. lots and lots of augmented chords. Uh, some of the more serious, um, serious, scenes were treated with lots of dense brass, very low and dense brass, for example. Uh, Nina, um, her taste in music is that she, she, she doesn't want the typical Hollywood, although Bernard Herrmann is Hollywood, but it's more like old Hollywood. Yeah. She didn't want here we come, da 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 da. You know, she said, yeah, yeah. "Don't give me Star Wars." She would <laughs> yeah. say that again and again. Of course, I would love to score Star Wars. But, you know, John Williams is doing a pretty good job on that. But you know, but she doesn't want that. She didn't want right. the, the big, flashy Hollywood sound. So it was in that you know because there are dramatic scenes. So how do I make it? Uh, how do I make a musical point without being over the top and making it? star wars you know exactly yeah so so that was very challenging and i think i i was able to do it uh, via the uh, instrumentation that i that i picked the harp for example has a, a lot of room here and we recorded we recorded the only thing we recorded separately was the harp mm. because i wanted to be able to control i i wanted a very specific sound from the harp and i wanted to be in a room only with a harpist and make sure that in that case, she understand what I wanted because right. the harp also um, there's a, there's a kind of a marching theme as we call it that is powerful uh, in a way that we women are addressing this issue now and we're going forward. Mm. So I created this 
you know, so I didn't want to do, uh, you know, like a snare, ta -ta -ga -da -ga -da, here we're going to war. That wasn't that. It was right. subtle, you know, it was just like, ta -ta, ta -ta -ta, ta -ta -ta, ta -ta -ta, you know, to, to have a feel of a, of a drive. Um, in regard to, regards to the, um, to the film clip, so there are about 191 of them. Wow. Some of them, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. So some of them have the original music in the clip. Some of them I scored. Oh, wow. Yeah. That must have been, inter must have been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> very, very interesting. And some of them I had to get in and out within the clip. So I made sure that if I have, let's say, I'm, I'm, my music, I'm in scene here, the clip comes here. So I would write the clip in the key of, I'm, not, I'm sorry, write the score in the key of the clip. Mm. So there is a very natural, flawless, um, you know, entrance into the film clip itself. But then we might have two or three film clips that are one after the other. They're not in the same key. So how do I now get out of this one right. and make it in, into my own? And what if I need to stay? I mean, this was this was this was complicated. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but extremely rewarding as well. And thank god nina gave me enough time to do it right yeah um, although we still had to postpone the recording twice uh, <laughs> because we came into a crunch um, and she was fine with that and what happened uh the first sequence of the film the first scene is about four minutes which is a long time as you know in film music yeah yeah it's a long time and i constructed it and i wrote it and i sent it to nina and she called me with such excitement. Yes, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. This is perfect. This is exactly, I have a few minor tweaks, but this is what I was looking for. So the minute she likes that, she trusted me from that point, even though she never that's worked great. with a composer before. But that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing because it, it must have felt, felt good to, to have that, that reaction. <laughs> I feel great. And it doesn't yeah. always happen because, as yeah. you know, um, writing a film score is really a combination, a collaboration with, between the uh, director and, and the filmmaker and, and the film composer. Yeah. And sometimes it takes two, three, four tries until we see eye to eye and we get to really understand the vision of the, of the uh, director. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes it takes longer. Yeah. So yeah. here I was like, oh my God, I just hit it right. Right out of the park, right first there. try. <laughs> and so from that point on, yeah, she had comments. She's very, Nina is very meticulous. Although yeah, she doesn't I mean, she has to direct music, and guide you too. Yeah, that's her job as well. That, her, that is her job. And like some, sometimes she would say, under this, this speaker, I feel that the, the music is a bit too heavy. You know, and I feel that we need to give more room, right? I think, things like that. You know, many times in documentaries, you can't do too much, you have to be kind of a um, really like a base that the speakers sit on, so you just support, but you can't be too melodic or right, you know, right? And in here. I had opportunities. Of, there was a lot of speakers, yes, but I had a lot of op opportunities to speak musically a lot, especially the end and uh, the beginning, the end, um, something, uh, many scenes in the middle. And the end, uh, there's, a, I think, a three minutes cue or that, like, throughout half of it, there's no more talking. That's it. And mm. it's, it's, I, I really had the opportunity here to, to speak out and it was so wonderful. And we were kind of in a crunch at the end. And I said to Nina, you know, let me just edit some of the music for the end credits. You know, we have uh, about three and a half minutes or four minutes end credits. 
And I said, let me just edit some of the music because, you know, there's not, not enough time to write another three minutes cue, right? Right. So I, yeah. I did that. I sent it to her and she said, Sharon, I feel that this is not working because we've already been there. We're now in a different place. And I said, okay. And I, I sat down and I wrote um, three almost four minutes of music, um, which now it's like my favorite cue. I'm so happy that she <laughs> asked me to do that. Um, and because I feel that that this cue, you know, the, those who heard it said, wow, this sounds like, you know, like like Batman or Superman. It's there's like this this heaviness to it, and but also mystery. I'll send it to you so you can listen. Yeah, I would um, love to. Yeah. <laughs> I should have done it before the interview. You can edit that, but <laughs> I'll send it to you. So um so it, it was a very complicated score. It was a very complicated uh score that really how do you portray you know all the Hollywood but still being Hollywood but you know yeah it was just really um and I listened to to Vertigo and you know looked at the score of Vertigo which is very hard to to find right away I, I had to really ask friends <laughs> for help with that yeah. um, I'm very proud of this project not only um because uh, of my music that i i feel that i did the right thing here and really supported it but also because of the subject matter and my co contribution to it as a film composer and as a woman you know we are still five percent composers i know so, yeah you know it's why i mean yes i mean it's yeah it, i mean the, the, this i think documentary also points at that too i mean it's showcasing how that shift is needs to happen i mean i know we've been talking about it for years and i think it's gotten more in the spotlight but i think we keep looking at these numbers at the end of the year and it's the top films of the year is still yeah you said five percent it's still so small i mean we can look at at, at all the interviews that you've done most yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been, I, I love talking to every composer. I mean, and, and of course, you, you, you have such a, you know, your style is amazing. I, I have listened to your music and it's, it's oh, thank you. and it's, uh, I think you provide, and just your whole view on music and the, just the art form is, is so enlightening and inspiring. So of course, thank you for sharing everything that you have. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, you know, there's, there's so much more to say. There's always more to say. So I hope yes. to, to continue um saying that and i hope that more women will be considered as equals because since the oscars started in 1948 i think in 90 a few years later they started um i have the statistics somewhere but i think just a few years later they started with original score yeah since then i think so in 53 maybe i can't remember exactly um since then until 2021 only three women have been nominated for an Oscar. I know. All three of them won, but we're talking about what, 60 years, 70 years of, yeah. of Oscars. So I'm, I'm, please don't think that for a minute I'm, I have a victim mentality because I think victim right. mentality is wrong for everybody and it doesn't help anything. And I've been very, very blessed. You know, I've been working steadily since since I graduated, because I don't take no for an answer. And um, I've had a lot of, of opportunities that were that I was not considered for because I am a woman. I can't even tell you how many big executives told me that if I was a man, I would be scoring the biggest films. Well, you know, I'm not a man. What can so I do? You crazy, know? Yeah. One of them, when I got pregnant and he heard that I was pregnant, big executive said jokingly, Okay, Sharon, see you in 18 years. <laughs> now, would you say that to a man? You know? No, no. And I never, ever, ever, you know, my whole career missed a deadline. In fact, <laughs> I was back to work two days after I gave birth. Wow. Because I had a crazy. deadline. I had a deadline. You know, it was painful physically, but I had a deadline. And I yeah. wouldn't miss a deadline. So the fact that we, you know, have um, womanly issues doesn't mean that 
anyone should know about that, you know, yeah. if I have to deal with my own, I, I mean, this is, I, I'll never use that as an excuse. I mean, unless I'm giving birth in this moment, you know, but. Yeah, I think giving but, birth uh, is a good excuse. You but. Know, <laughs> but seriously, it's like, um, that's why women are stronger. You know, we're so strong. We can take yeah. it, you know, so. It's yeah, the stories um, that I've heard from other fem female composers, I mean, I, in light awakens, you know, my, my thoughts are because I don't experience that. And I, you know, try to, uh, you know, not, you know, I know I, I have privilege as a white male, you know, in this industry of automatically, but it's something, you know, uh, when I hear these stories and hearing your stories, that's like, it, it just like, what the hell, you know, it's like, what, like, how is this happening? And, and I, I'm thankful that the people I surround myself with aren't those people, but I, the fact that it is happening and, and of course, great amounts, it's still happening. Um, it's still shocking to me every time I hear something yeah. like that. I lost a TV series like three years ago because I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do what the uh, director wanted me to do. Yeah. Um, I scored a film, recorded with a full orchestra, and I was, uh, <laughs> there was like seven men and me at the recording session. The recording went amazingly. The director was so happy. And then he said something, and I can't remember what he said, but he said something that he would never accept to a man. Yeah. So here I am, one little tiny, I'm pretty tiny, you know, pretty tiny person. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, younger. And now I'm in this situation. What do I do? If I say something now, everybody will say, oh, hysterical woman, you know, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I don't say anything, he's going to keep on, you know, stepping, stepping on me. Mm -hmm. So I waited for the um, break. I took him aside and said, why did you say it? And he said, oh, I'm sorry. Were you hurt, honey? I was like, I'm not honey. Yeah. I'm the film composer that you chose out of many others because of what I bring to your film. You love what I'm doing right now. And if you want my respect, you need to start respecting me because what you hear now is making your film so much better. And you're happy with that. And that's not acceptable. The way you talk to me is not acceptable. And he got it and said, you know what? You're right. I would never say this to a man. And I'm so sorry. And it will never happen again. And it never happened again. That's good. But um, I'm I mean strong. But not everybody is. And yeah. you know, someone who, a woman who maybe, you know, it's her first gig or something and she needs to, you know, stand in front of someone like that. And, and I mean, not everybody is that strong. Yeah. And then if you're, and then you might think, oh, well, this is how it's supposed to be. Or this is like exactly. when you're in Hollywood. And, and that ties yeah. back into brainwash where it's like, oh, this is how men the yeah. male gaze and how women are viewed and this yeah. and it all kind of snowballs and ties into each other and it's all yeah i mean it's and i think changing the narrative and talking about these subjects is important because it's bringing a light to it and yeah. and it's not stuff anybody wants to hear but it's stuff that people need to hear because it's it, the way people are treated you know it's just it's, it's exactly. ridiculous <laughs> yeah and we try that, you know to really help you know we have a mentoring uh, program with the alliance for women film composers which is yes, the vice yeah. president and I, when I mentor, I mentor Berkeley students, um, master students from Berkeley. And, you know, it's interesting to see sometimes the difference between men and women. And, and as one of the speakers say in the film, it's not that women do not go to film schools. They do. They go to mm -hmm. film schools and they go to yeah. study film music and they're so excited. And then they come in to LA or to any, anywhere else that, you know, there's an industry and, and they're shut down and they're like, okay, uh, what do I do now? And yeah. it is hard to be a film composer or anything in this industry from, from, from the get go, you know, yeah. from the beginning to everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a white male or, uh, or, or African American woman or transgender. It's hard for everybody. So that's, that's the beginning of it. So you need yep. to have a lot of patience and a lot of determination to, to get up every morning, even, even if you got 50 no's, because someone will say yes at, at yes. one point. Yeah. And, but not everybody has the patience or the support 
you know, the support system. I, I married a Berkeley guy, <laughs> you know, so, who's, who's wonderful and understand and, and supports me because he's a musician as well. But not yeah. everybody has this kind of support. And many, even today, many um, families, many parents believe that a woman shouldn't go after a career. It's getting much better, of course. Some women yeah, yeah. get their CEOs and everything, but in in and certainly in, in certain cultures, it's like, oh, you're the man. You go and make money. You you choose whatever you want to do. You know, you get married. Yeah. You know, it still exists. Sure, you know? yeah, it still exists, and and I think more than we think. And how do we encourage more women? You know. I'll give you an example. Some of the major uh, music libraries approached me in how in helping them, in helping trying to help them get more women to do library music. Mm. And I said, why would I do that when in order to even if you use an orchestra, it will take you 10 years to recoup. And then you're taking 75%. Yeah. I mean, and all the publishing. I mean, why, why would I encourage women? You want women to do that? Give women better pay. Mm -hmm. Give them better percentage. It's our music. You know, that's why I don't do, you know, and I, I've done library music and I'm very proud of, of, of what I've done, especially one of these, yeah, we'll talk about it and I have a, something that I want to say. Um, but it has to be everybody that does that needs to be treated with respect. That's all. Yeah, We're not absolutely. machines. It's not like, oh, people think, oh, you just put your... <laughs> Someone called me about a film and she said, it's, it's a short film and, you know, I really want to work with you. And I said, and I don't do short films usually, mm -hmm. but it was an important subject matter. I said, okay, what's your deadline? She said, February 1st, I said, when will you have a locked picture? And she said, I don't know, maybe January 25th. <laughs> I said, so you're working on this for two years and you expect me to write 30 minutes of music in five days, including mix and everything. But yeah. it's not, it doesn't work like that. We're not yeah. musicians. Well, we are in a way, but you know, it's not like I put my fingers on the, on the piano and it's there. It's a process. You have to live with the film. You have to understand the film. You have to try different melodies, different harmonies, different sound textures. We need we need to be able to do this, you know. And, and yeah, you need the the, the, the resources and the time. The and I think, and I the, the one thing that I love, I why I keep doing these interviews is because I I've seen like you know I, I when I how I got inspired into filmmaking was when I the biggest thing when I was younger in the '90s, late '90s when DVDs came out was the bonus features. And you got to see people talk about the craft behind the scenes. It wasn't just the, the movie or the product, you know, it's like, what is going on behind? And I feel like with streaming now, people aren't, aren't getting professionals talking about it. And it, so when you have a, a young filmmaker coming up through film school and they're all shooting on DSLRs, everything is quick and instant, instant. And then they expect things. And that's, you know, go, going through the industry where people just like, oh, it has to turn around in a week. That's and that's right. how it is. And that's it's like, it what? And, no. <laughs> and exactly. And you know, when you look at this, when you watch a film in a streaming uh, platform, the minute the film ends, either you get into the new film or there's, they put a credit yeah, in like this little yeah. box that nobody can see. It's so yeah. disrespectful. You know? Yeah, I hate the skip intro and I hate the, I always try to come back and because I like to sit and listen to the music and watch the credits as I, you know, digest the movie or whatever I just watched. And we're but you are culture. one of a kind, you know. Yeah, There's I know. It's, many, a it's not a. I mean, yeah. the average, yeah, the average viewer will just, oh, okay, let's skip that and let's go to the next one. Yep. Who who was the custom designer? Who designed the set? Who yeah. who worked on the music? Who was the uh, gopher? I don't know. Who was the cameraman? Who was this? It's like you know, they used to be uh, to have all the credits at the beginning yeah he's the key people yeah some people some some filmmakers still do that i like saying it you know because yeah, you you, you have the audience trapped you know they're not leaving exactly Even, you have the yeah, audience trapped. Yeah. and maybe that's a way to do it because otherwise it's it's 
they don't know, nobody really, until you do it, until you're part of the industry, you yeah. really can't understand how a film comes together and how so many people are making such an extreme effort to make it happen. Yeah, And people I just agree. don't know, they don't understand. You know, so I think uh, critics are kind of, I don't like the critic culture either, kind of, uh, people get paid. I, it's an opinion, sure, everyone has an opinion, but it, but it's like Rotten Tomatoes, I think, is one of the biggest detriments to films, and it's like you're reducing movies to a percentage. It's like, who are these people? Do you know these people who are writing exactly. these reviews? <laughs> like, exactly. you don't know. They, they could be assholes. You don't know, <laughs> you know? And most of them have never done a film. Go do a film, then you can be a critic, okay? Yeah. First show that you can go through this whole process, and then, you know, then yeah. we'll see. And then you put your art out there for other people to critic. And we'll yeah, see I how you feel. I, mean, it's, it's just... I agree with that. I mean, it's a, it's a great to discuss movies and anybody can have an opinion, discuss it, but to to get paid for uh, like even with anything objective, it's objective. It's not subjective. It's Nothing. It speaks to you or it doesn't. Exactly. It doesn't matter. You don't get to tell somebody that they're stupid because they like something and you don't, or like, this is my opinion, it's better than the other. I always love, yeah, that's why I, the best critic is to go with your movie, your friends to go see a movie and then have a drink and I, discuss I, it I, afterwards. Yeah. But you know, even even I mean I think it's so embedded in our subconscious that when you go on Netflix and you see that this film got two stars and yeah. this one got five stars, who, what are you going to watch? The two one or the five one? You know, right. so why yeah. us, Even if we don't realize, you know, it, going back to brainwashed for a minute, um, as I told you, um, you'll never watch a film the same way mm -hmm. after we watch brainwashed. And I realized that when I watched one of the, um, you know, I'm on the Motion Pictures Academy Executive Committee. So I, I, yeah. I, I sometimes I need to watch specific films to see if they're um, eligible. And I watched a movie that was really nice movie. I, I won't, you know, name it. There's a part in the movie that these two people, men and women, um, they basically talk on the phone. The guy is very macho. Mm -hmm. We see him fully dressed in army uniform, in the army base, you know, and he's talking and he's like, he's all manly, right? And he talks to, the, to his love, lo lover, his, his, you know, the woman who he's gonna marry. They're not talking about sex. They're not talking about, it's like, when are you coming? You know, things like that, right. trivial, um, tribal things. And so we see him, we just saw him, right? With this, with this manly attitude. Yeah. Talking on the phone, standing, you know, here I am. And we see the woman lying in bed, uh, wearing a t-shirt and underwear, talking on the phone. But what do we see? We, we hear her voice. We don't see her. We, the, pan, the camera pans extremely slowly from her toes yeah. up her naked, very naked legs to her yeah. underwear, to her t-shirt until we get to her lips talking. Now, they're not talking about sex. There's nothing sexy about the scene. They're just talking a day-to-day -day thing yeah then why why is he not naked maybe i'd like to see him naked not only exactly. the male want to see her naked you know it's like it's it's the male gaze yeah the male gaze exactly. and, and Which... please don't get me wrong i'm heterosexual married to a wonderful man i love yeah, yeah. men i love men yeah, I, love I, mean, women, I love men you know i love friends yeah. you know I, I but i'm a heterosexual and you know so when you are pen the camera in that way who is your target audience exactly yeah it's not me you know maybe you you know because how do we want people to we want them to keep on watching yeah don't you trust as a filmmaker don't you trust that their conversation is interesting enough that you need to bring sexualization of her only into the scene. And I, so, and the thing is that before brainwashed, I would never even think about it. It's like, yeah, sure, you know, I, I wouldn't even pay attention. 
Yeah. But now yeah. it's like things like that jumps and like, oh my God, they could have shot this differently, but they chose to, to shoot it in a way that objectifies and sexualizes the woman, only the woman, right. not the man. Yeah. What it's always it? it's always one sided, and it's it's, yeah. it's something I, I would. I was watching a show with a friend, and not to get too graphic or anything, but there was a lot of male nudity, and I mean, he was like, "Oh, why are there so many, why are there so many, you know, penises or whatever?" And I'm just like, "Why not? Well, you know, show more. It can be, you know, <laughs> typically it's you know, if you're watching HBO, it's, it's usually exactly. naked naked women. It's just like, why not throw throw a couple penises up there? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you see when you see, uh, even. Uh, um, Mina addresses it when when do you see uh, women uh, men in slow motion? When do you see slow motion or body panning on a woman on a man? It's like when Rocky is like whoosh, you know, and, yeah, and fighting, all war and champion, all the men are yeah. jumping, mm -hmm. and there's just a bomb behind them, and they jump and they're just saved by the and women. When yeah. do you see them? When they're sexualized, when they're doing, you know, sexualizing things, yeah. you know, and they're having There's a fan and... blowing and the hair is, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mysterious fans. <laughs> yeah, and these are things that I would never ever think about. So, yeah. which means that I myself, I, I'm brainwashed in, yeah. in the way yeah. that I've been, you know, taught to, to look at films. And you know everybody's like me, right? Yeah. Because yeah. because that's how it's embedded in us. Yeah, and it's like it's okay. Oh, it's okay. It's it's a slow motion because it's manly because we want to show every muscle that mm -hmm. he has, but we want to show every body curve that she has. So we have to show her bits. You know, it's like yeah, no, you exactly. don't. Yeah. No. But it's um, I'm very very um, proud to be a part of this of this film of this very needed conversation, and I'm very yeah. grateful for Nina. Nina is brilliant. She's brilliant. She because you know this 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 is this came from a a lecture that she uh, presents uh, talking about this issue mm -hmm. uh, issues, and but the way she, she said it you know so many times after the lecture people came to her students and say you have to make this into a film so people you know would be yeah. uh, able to to know about it and address it but the way she constructed it it's there's not a dull moment it's like oh there's a lecture and we're listening to it. no there's so much going on from from the lecture to 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 the, the clips and again i mean it's 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 fascinating. It's really fascinating. And I think she's she did a brilliant job and I'm very honored to be a part of it, as I said, and also very proud of the score. Uh, yes, because yeah. I feel that I was able to um, support uh, the movie and her vision without uh, without losing my own self, you know, although I had a uh, um, a great uh, master to guide me is Bernard Herrmann. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm. Congratulations again on. I'm, it seems like it was such a creatively rewarding experience. It seems like it was such a different experience. And on top of that, you can use it to create a dialogue and a conversation, which we just had. And uh, I, it was just such a pleasure to chat with you uh, tonight. And and just just your whole viewpoint on everything was just so enlightening. So, Sharon, thank you so much thank for. You. For, for, so much, for, for chatting and thank uh, you for having me of course yes <laughs>